Good to see everybody this morning. If you will, turn your Bibles over to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. In just a moment, we're going to read from there. But as you're turning, we're going to continue our theme this morning on grace. Uh, this is kind of the theme of the month. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. These were words written by a man by the name of John Newton. John Newton originally was a slave trader. He said that he spent most of his life either in moral, immoral debauchery or trying to, to sink other people into immoral debauchery. And as he wrote these words, it's kind of an interesting thing that a lot of people don't really know about him. On his conversion, he did not change from being a slave trader. As a matter of fact, he was converted to Christianity. And then later on, after many years of being in the slave trade, he came to realize that, you know, I really don't need to be doing this. And it wasn't until he fully understood what he was doing that he could leave the slave trade and then later write that song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, that saved a wretch like me, a man who dealt in the selling and the buying of the souls of man. Over in Luke chapter 18, Jesus is addressing a problem that is kind of common to every and each and every one of us. Years ago, there was a movie called Eyes Wide Shut. And you know, spiritually, there's a lot of us who have our eyes wide shut. And when I say that is that we are blind not only to our sins, but we are even blind to our own blindness. We're blind and don't realize that where we are. Jesus addressed this problem of being blind to your own blindness in Luke 18, as Luke is going to record in verse 9. And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. He is speaking to those who were what we would call self-righteous. That is, they had a list that they checked off every day and they felt good about themselves because they had their list. And I did this and did this and I didn't do that, didn't say that, didn't think that, and I did all these things that I was supposed to do. And boy, I just feel so good about myself. And then they viewed other people who were struggling in areas where they were strong and they viewed them with contempt. That is, they looked at them and thought about how bad they were. Now notice that Jesus is going to tell this parable. A parable is a story that has a moral behind it. The word parable comes from two Greek words, para and bole. It means to throw alongside. Uh, and it's an idea of a story that tells a story. And so listen to what Jesus says. He says in verse 10 that two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. You know, Jesus talked about a whole gamut of people. He talked of those who were Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees, remember, there were basically three or four different religious sects. There were the Herodians, there were the scribes, there were the Sadducees, and there were the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were a very religious group of people, probably as religious as you could get. And their religion was based on, and their righteousness rather, was based on how good they could perform their righteousness. It was all what we would call performance-based. It was performance-based. On the far end of the spectrum were those people that the Pharisees viewed with contempt, and this was the tax collectors. Now, you talk about a ruthless group of people. You've got this very religious group of people, and then you've got this very ruthless group on the other end that were tax collectors. Jesus did not just pull out these folks out of midair by chance, but he had something in mind because when you talk about a tax collector, you're talking about somebody who is an opportunist. You're talking about a Jew who does the dirty work for the Roman Empire. The Romans would come into a nation. They would occupy that nation by not only just collecting taxes, but they would collect tribute from them. You remember that one of our forefathers said, millions for charity, but not one dime for tribute. Why? Because tribute is a tax you pay to somebody not to destroy you. 
Well, the Romans, their gross national product. Here in America, we have a lot of national products. We have products like soybeans, wheat, minerals that we sell, chemicals that we sell. Those are gross national products. Their gross national product was war. War was expensive. It's expensive. If you've noticed our uh, budget, you notice we spend a lot of money here in the United States on defense, don't we? It takes a lot of money to maintain a standing military. And the same thing was true in that day. Soldiers were expensive. You had to outfit them. You had to buy them weapons. You had to tr pay for their transportation. You had to pay them a salary. Plus, you had to feed them and clothe them and house them while they're wherever they are. And so there's a lot of expense that goes into soldiers today and back then. And he says, now, this tax collector was a Jew who took the opportunity of exacting distribute money from the Roman, from the Jewish people that the Romans might not destroy them. And so they were looked upon and hated. They were looked upon with disdain. And so Jesus says there are two men who go down to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. He is recognized as one of the most religious people of his day. The other one was a tax collector. You talk about a sinner. This was a sinner. And so he says, they both go to the temple to pray and notice what is said, the conversation that is said to the Lord by each one. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and was praying to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. And you know, right now he's already in trouble, isn't he? I thank you that I am not like other people. Number one, when did he realize he wasn't in the same boat that everybody else is in? He is. He's in the same boat that I'm in, that you're in. We're all sinners before God. But he didn't see that. You see, his eyes were wide shut. They were wide shut. He was blind to his own blindness. Notice what he says. I thank you that I am not like other people. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. You see, he even had a case in point. Lord, look, I'm not like him. I'm not like this opportunist over here. I'm not like this greedy man. I'm not like him at all. And I'm so thankful that I'm not like everybody else. It's amazing how that the Pharisees could apply the law to everybody but themselves. Remember, Jesus talked a lot about the Pharisees and the way that they lived. You know, he said, you've heard that it is said that you shall not commit adultery. He is referring now to the, uh, or I'm referring to the, the Sermon on the Mount. And he goes on to say, but if you look at a woman in, in, in lust after her in your own heart, you've already committed adultery. You see, they maybe didn't do the physical act, but they had the thought. He says, and he goes on to say that you may love your neighbor, but if you hate your neighbor... You look at him with contempt. You call him bad names. You've committed murder in your heart. He says, guess what? You've committed murder. And so he was like other people. He was. He didn't realize it, but he was like other folks. And today this serves as a tremendous warning for us. As we think about grace, this morning we sing that wonderful song and sometimes people can sing that song and say, boy, I'm sure glad it did. Don't apply to me. I don't have to have the grace of God in my life. Guess what? You do too. You do have to have the grace of God in your life. You got to have his mercy in your life. You don't want to be like this man here who looked at other people with contempt and said, I'm glad I'm not like him. Well, you may not be like him in your area of life, but I can guarantee you there's some things in your life that need the grace of God. He goes on in verse 20, he says, For I fast twice a week. This is his, he had his don't list, now his do list. I pay tithes of all that I get. Remember that Jesus said that the Pharisees, they tithe the mint and the cumin and the anise. That is, these little garden vegetables, whenever they bring those little tiny leaves in. You ever seen a mint leaf? It's a little small thing. Can you just imagine somebody sitting down with a bag of leaves and counting it out? You know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, this tenth one goes to the Lord. Now, one, two, three. See, they used a lot of these, these uh, spices in their cooking and in their tea. They were tea drinkers. They weren't coffee drinkers as we usually are today. But they drink tea and they put a lot of these spices in their, 
their, um, their tea and they use spices like cumin. That's a big one that they use in their cooking even today. And I don't know if you've ever seen uh, cumin or not, but it's little tiny seeds about like a uh, a, a dill seed or a sesame seed. Can you imagine counting them out and every tenth one giving to the Lord? Boy, just feeling so good and so special about yourself. And Jesus went on to say, although you count these little seeds and little leaves out and you give me the tenth ones, yet you have let go of the weightier matters of the law. And he talks about justice and righteousness and judgment on people, not giving mercy. He says that you have forgotten about the weightier matters of the law, but they were feeling so special about themselves because they tithe. But now notice in verse 13, but the tax collector standing some distance away was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven. This other man came before God in boldness of God. Look how good I am, how righteous I am, how much you owe me because of what I do for you. But yet, Look at this man's posture. He wouldn't even look up. But the Bible says he was standing a distance way off. Where the Pharisee approached, this man would not even approach. Wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven. But was beating upon his breast, beating upon his chest, clutching his chest, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He said, I'm a sinner. Do you realize this morning, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm fine. was blind, but now I see. Do you truly see as John Newton intended for us to see in this song that he saved a sinner like me? Do you view yourself as a sinner? That you need the grace of God in your life? Or you like the Pharisee? Are like this tax collector. Jesus goes on to say that I tell you in verse 14 that this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself, lifts himself up, will be humbled. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now I'm sure that just raised the hair on the necks of the Jews. They didn't like this at all. For Jesus to talk about them. But Jesus came with a message not of how you work your way into heaven, but rather what he was doing to get you there through his death upon the cross. That's how we get to heaven. Our faith in him. Now faith is more than just intellectual belief or assent. You know, faith is not just saying, well, I believe in Jesus. Faith leads to action in my life. It is a belief that causes me to act a certain way. And whenever I refer to faith, and when Paul talks about in Ephesians 2 that we're saved by grace through faith, he's not just talking about, well, I believe in Jesus and go off and live my merry life any way that I want to. No, he is saying that my faith is a belief that is going to change the way I live, that I'm going to pattern myself after Jesus, that I'm going to strive to live like him. Perfectly, no. But ever striving, yes. And so when we talk about faith, we're not talking of just mental assent, but we're talking of truly believing in God. And this morning... Jesus tells this parable in Luke 18 that we truly need to see, and that is we need the grace of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul said, and you were dead in sins and trespasses. He goes on and he talks about the fact that in this present state that we're in, in sin, we are separated from God. You cannot... You cannot get to God in your sin. You've got to have His grace. In verse 4 he says, But God who is rich in His grace and mercy wherein He saved us through Jesus Christ and His atoning blood. Now this morning we need to see this. And not only as we look at that first point there of a clear perspective of grace. Let me tell you, I need the grace of God in my life. You know why? I'm not perfect. I've never been perfect, and I never will be perfect. And uh, I need God's grace in my life. And so here is a clear perspective that we find in Luke chapter 18. And then number two, not only do we need a clear perspective, but we need also to understand the 
conforming or the, the provision of God's grace. The provision of God's grace. You know, we talk about the reality of, of the judgment of God. If you notice in Romans chapter 1, and we don't have time this morning to read this chapter, we'll look at it more on Wednesday night. But let me just give you six things here when we talk about the realities of the judgment of God. In Romans chapter 2, that, there's where you're going to find these six realities. And just write them down because Sunday, Wednesday night we're going to look at these. Number one in verse 1 is the reality of the judgment of God. It's real. It's going to happen. It's reality. Number two, God's judgment is going to be according to his integrity. Verses two and three. His integrity. You see, God does not see as man sees, as he told uh, Jesse in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, when Jesse was bringing out all of his sons. You remember Samuel says, do you have a son? He's going to be the next king of Israel. Jesse brought out this one. Said, that's not him. Next one, that's not him. Next one, that's not him. And he says, finally, do, don't you have any more? He says, oh yeah, I've got one, David. He's just a little boy. He brings him out. He says, that's him. In verse 7, he says, for God does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart, the integrity of man. And so number two, God's judgment is according to integrity. Number three, it is according to opportunity. Verse chapter, Romans chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Opportunity. And then in verses 6 through 10, it is according to obedience. Not only my opportunity, but also how well I obey. My obedience. Number 5, verses 11 through 15, God judges impartially. It doesn't matter who you are. He is going to judge us. And then... Verse 16, he tells us that the judgment of God is according to certainty. As certain as we are born, it is going to happen. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew writer says that it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Judgment is going to come upon us. It's certainty. Now, as we think about the comforting provision of God's grace... God brought us grace, and over in Romans chapter 5, we're in chapter 2, but let's go over to Romans chapter 5 for just a moment. And I want us to read just a, a few verses together. As a matter of fact, we just want to read verses 1 through 11. And I want to notice about seven things right here real quickly, and we'll talk about them a little bit more on Wednesday night. Therefore... Having been justified by faith. Now notice this, justification. The word justification literally is a Greek word which means, and we don't have a word in the English for it, it means righteousfied. It means to be declared righteous. I'm not righteous, but because of my faith in what Jesus has done for me, he says, I am declared righteous. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, notice that he says that we have been justified. You know, a diamond, its brilliance is determined by how many sides it has on it. God's grace has multi sides. It is multifaceted, as we would call it. Its first face is called justification. But then number two, look in verse two, the beginning of verse two, through whom also we have obtained our introduction. How did we get into this grace? By faith into this grace. Remember we talked about faith earlier in our lesson. Faith is more than just mental assent. Yeah, I believe in God. Does it change your life? No, it doesn't. Well, that's not faith. Faith says, I believe in God, and you can see that I believe in God. Why? Because I change the way I live, and I live for the Lord. I want to please Him. I want to do what He wants me to do. Now, that is faith. 
And so there is faith, the access. Number three, with this access into it comes joy. Joy. Look at the latter part of verse 2. Through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exalt in hope of the glory of God. You know, this morning, through our faith in Jesus, what Jesus has done for us, we can have joy. It's not dependent upon how good I have been in the past. It's my faith. Now, my faith is going to change my actions. It's going to change my thinking. It's going to change my behavior. But by faith, he says, through faith, I exalt, I rejoice in those things. And what does that do? Well, look in verses 3 and 4. It brings about, number 4, change. It brings about change. Listen to verse 3. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. You see, we begin a trip, and the trip brings about a change in our life. It takes us to perseverance and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. You see, that is a change for the better, a change for the better. And then look in verses 5 through 8 that this all came about because of an offering that God made. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The word poured out, that phrase, is the same Greek word that is used that talks of whenever an offering was made and something was poured out. It was poured out. It's the same word. He says that this which was Poured out. Why? Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts. Look in verse 6. For while we were still helpless in the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one, we hardly die for a righteous man. Though perhaps for the good man, some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, there's that other part, that sacrifice, that offering that God has made for us. Look in verses 9 and 10. This offering was His blood. Let's read verse 9 and 10 together. Much more than having now been justified by His blood. You see, it is blood, the blood of Christ. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And that brings about verse 11, reconciliation. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Reconciliation, to be reconciled with God. Peace. Remember, Jesus came into the world to offer what? Remember the song we sing, Joy to the World? What was the words that inspired that song? The angels said to the shepherds, That unto you is born this day a king, and he will bring what? Peace. Reconciliation. You see, today we look for peace throughout the world. Peace can be yours. Reconciliation through Jesus Christ. Now we've talked about the perspective of grace and the provision of grace. I want to, to close out thinking about the what I call the connecting point of grace. In Acts chapter 9, there was a man by the name of Saul. He was from Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus, he hated Christians. He hated them and detested them to the point that he murdered them, imprisoned them, tried to drive them away, tried to stamp Christianity out. 
Later on, this man who was the hunter was converted and became the hunted. As a matter of fact, in 1 Timothy 1, verses 13, 14, and 15, Paul tells Timothy, For I am a man least likely to be an apostle. Why? Because of the way I persecuted the church beyond measure. But he says it was through Jesus. And he says, For this is a worthy acceptation, worthy of all listening, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. You know, this morning, Paul says, I became, I was the hunter, but I came the hunted. You know why? Because of the grace of God. God's grace is what saved me. Years ago, S.W. Brom an English writer writes about an event that took place in 1878. This was when Cleopatra's Needle, I know that's kind of an odd name, but it was a stone monument that had been built in Egypt over 3,500 years ago. And Cleopatra had erected this needle. It's called Cleopatra's Needle. And it was erected to honor the Caesars of the Roman Empire. It hurt a, the Romans were, had conquered and was occupying Egypt. And she put up this monument in memory and in honor of the, the Roman Empire. And it's called Cleopatra's Needle. In 1878, Cleopatra's Needle was moved to the banks of the Thames River. Now, all of England and um, London and all the area around came and watched as this thing that had been erected over 3,500 years ago was built, was re-erected there uh, in England. And he writes about that. He was just a little boy at the time, but he says that there was a time capsule. He is told by his father later, he's only 9 or 10 years old when the needle was, was erected, uh, there in London. But there was a time capsule that was placed at the base of Cleopatra's needle. And guess what? It's still there today. Over a hundred and what, 25, 30 years later, that needle is there and that time capsule is there. Inside that time capsule, there was a number of things. Now, I don't know why they chose the things that they did, but they chose these things right here. Inside that time capsule... There is a London directory, a directory of that date of 1878. There is also a set of coins, coins of the British Empire. And I really don't understand this one, but they placed a straight razor in there. But also they placed a Bible verse in 200 in 15 languages. This one Bible verse. But it is in it in 215 different languages. Now this was the thinking of the people in, 17, or in 1878. As they placed that capsule thinking that, you know, someday there's going to be somebody that's going to come along. And uh, it may be hundreds and hundreds of years later. And they're going to open this time capsule. And these things are going to be in it. And there's going to be this one verse of Scripture, and hopefully of the 215 different languages that this one verse of Scripture is in, that they will know what that Scripture says. I bet you already know what Scripture that is. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the reconciliation that we're talking about this morning. Did you know, a time capsule cannot contain what God has done for us. He has sent His Son to die on the cross for our sins. This morning, do you need the grace of God applied to your life? Do you need to place your Lord on in baptism? Repenting of your sins, confessing Him as the Son of God, 
and allowing your faith to lead you into the waters of baptism that you can be buried with your Lord in baptism for the remission of your sins. This morning, the message is clear. God so loved the world, and that includes you, includes me. Won't you this morning come as we stand and sing?